I'm joined now by Dr. Raymond Chung and Dr. Nora Tarot talking about the HCV guidance and the refined HBV guidelines. So let's begin with HCV and Dr. Chung. If you could talk about now that some of the medications have been used in the real world, the difference if there is any in terms of efficacy and success rate from the clinical trials. With respect to the use of, of these new direct acting antiviral regimens, we've seen gratifyingly that uh, that because in, in many ways of their safety uh, profiles, uh, that they've been able to be used uh, for the most part, uh, uh, not only safely, uh, but, but also with, with the preservation of the high efficacy rates that we're seeing in the clinical trials uh, that led to their licensing. So we're very encouraged by the fact that, that again, many of the real world cohorts uh, that you just alluded to um, have, have, have reproduced um, uh, many of the findings that, that, uh, that were seen in the trials. These drugs that are already on the market, largely successful, yet a lot of research for newer drugs. Why is that? What's the goal? Well, that's a great question. I mean, so it appears that, that even with the advances that, that we have just seen, this dizzying array of advances, there are still pockets of treatment groups uh, that, that have uh, unmet needs. Um, a very good case in point would be patients with kidney failure, impaired kidney function on hemodialysis, who, um, who can't be safely administered many of the medications that are already approved. So, for instance, uh, there is an upcoming approval uh, of another combination uh, that has been proven to be not only safe but highly efficacious in just that group of patients. So we're seeing these extended, uh, uh, or we should say the introduction of new regimens that may work for distinct populations of patients, enhance the efficacy rates in yet other populations of patients. An example would be genotype 3 infected uh, patients who might be, if you, if you will, uh, perhaps just a, 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 a degree uh, less successful uh, than, than some of their other uh, genotype counterparts. And, uh, and so as a result, we're seeing some regimens that are directed uh, toward that group of patients um, that, have, that have enhanced activity uh, in, in, in those groups. So uh, we're, we're, we're trying to extend the coverage to, um, to perhaps uh, less well-covered groups um, uh, historically. And some of the new options may be available as soon as the first of the year. That's right. So, so for instance, our guidance document is going to be addressing with a revision um, uh, to uh, uh, accommodate, in fact, uh, the, the, uh, the data that, that, that accompanies uh, an abridgment we expect to be approved you know, as early as, as, as January. That covers, say, for instance, uh, patients um, uh, who have um, impaired uh, renal function, kidney function. Um, uh, and, and, and with that, I think I would say that the, the guidance has, has proven by being a web-based document to be a living, breathing uh, a document that, that is extraordinarily nimble and flexible, that, that has really been able to uh, accommodate uh, the rapidly changing uh, environment uh, surrounding treatment. Any other important things that you want to stress in that guidance? One of the important revisions that, that was uh, recently introduced to the guidance uh, was um, the removal of, of, uh, a, of a set of language around uh, prioritization of, of patients. It, in the original iteration of the guidance, uh, there had been uh, a statement that, that all patients should be treated, but there were some patient groups uh, in, a, in the context of, of perhaps um, uh, uh, resource constraints uh, who should be prioritized over others. The more recent uh, uh, version uh, has simply removed the prioritization language and, and has, has re-emphasized what has always been uh, the case uh, that, that we have been making, which is that all patients with hepatitis C should be treated because of the, in, the, the uh, extraordinary rates of cure that are possible now with these, these regimens. And how great to have those options. Let's move on to HBV and talk about the refined guidelines. So uh, for the first time, the ASLD has um, adopted the Institute of Medicine's sort of recommendation in terms of, of guidelines and have moved towards the GRADE system, which is a system which really tries to be very evidence-based and um, actually grades the level of evidence um, and the recommendations that are being made. So this is a shift from the prior guidelines that were made. Um, and the second thing that this guideline, how it differs from the prior, is that it's very focused on clinically important questions. So when the guidelines committee initially met, um, we, we focused on what are the key questions that clinicians ask themselves in the care of their patients for hepatitis B. And we developed um, nine specific questions that we were trying to address in the guideline. It's very focused on treatment um, and really targeting the key questions that are sort of facing clinicians in their practice of hepatitis B. So a, a shift from the prior guidelines, which was very broad, actually a very comprehensive document, now a little bit more narrowed, 
down to clinically relevant questions, and then bringing in this very um, rigorous assessment of the evidence, um, and then this grading system to allow the reader to know kind of the level of confidence that we have about the recommendations that we're making. What were some of the most common questions that clinicians had? Well, we, we are clinicians, those that participated in, in developing the guidelines, and I think we drew from our experience as well as we know from our other colleagues. And, and a key question, for example, we're addressing in the guideline that previously hasn't been sort of specifically addressed is the treatment of women who are pregnant and this uh, with the goal of trying to prevent perinatal transmission of hepatitis B. So the first, you know, that's a common question that comes up. Should we treat women in the third trimester of pregnancy with the goal of trying to prevent transmission from mother to child? And there has been a lot of data forthcoming over the last several years uh, to inform that question. And so we were able to come forward with a specific recommendation about that specific area of treatment and also to provide more information about if you're going to do treatment in the third trimester, what drugs should you use, how long should you give them, when should you stop. So all of the questions relevant to that are actually encompassed now in the guideline. How wonderful. It must give so much confidence in terms of being able to treat patients to have these specific guidelines and the data to back it up. Well, that's what we hope, and I think the question is there's probably more questions, you know, clinical questions that are actually than we have in the guideline, and I think it, uh, the idea of having something that can be constantly um, modified and improved upon and expanded is also, I think, sort of, you know, ultimately a goal. Similar to the guidance document, which is sort of this living, breathing document that continues to adapt as more data becomes available. Although we, it's not specifically in the cards yet, but I think that's kind of the goal ultimately with hepatitis B, which is also a field that's likely to change very much in the near future as well. And the adaptation is so important. Thank you so much. Some great information. Great. Thank you. Thank you.